Shalom. Welcome to the Shepherd's Light Online Church. Before the service starts, we wanted to invite you to join our chat. The chat is where you can ask questions, share verses, and connect with other viewers from around the world. Just write your first comment and choose the nickname to join. If you need prayer, click the live prayer icon and you'll be taken to a private chat where one of our team members will pray with you. The service is about to start. Don't forget to sign up so you can keep your username and profile. God bless you and enjoy the message.
song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one that could ever save Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you
God bless you and welcome home. Bruchim Avim Abayta. So good to be back again with you today and thanks so much for coming again this week. You know, we realize it's not always possible to travel to a service somewhere and to fellowship with the other people there, so we bring that service to you. If you've been here before, you already know. You can be anywhere in the world to see this service and come here and fellowship with the people here and we hope you'll be encouraged today as you discover God's peace his promises for your life. Now, would you open in your Bibles to the New Testament? Of course, you remember how to say that in Hebrew. New Testament is Habrit HaChadisha. And we're going to be again in the book of Ephesians, a new book that we just started recently. Going to be in chapter 2 today. And uh, not a lot of chapters in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2. We started chapter 1 and a couple of messages the last week or two, and that's where we're going to be today. And as you probably already know, we'll probably put those verses up here for you in the video just to make it easier for you to follow along. I'd like to talk to you today about peace and purpose in life. You know, we recently started this journey through the book of Ephesians and what it's all about, and after the gospel message in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, different accounts from the uh, different apostles about the life of Jesus, the things that he did, the miracles that happened, that God was doing through him, thousands and thousands of miracles, people being raised from the dead, people being healed, and people who were born blind now seeing, and all of these wonderful things that these hundreds of thousands of people had seen and thousands and tens of thousands had experienced. And we started that in the Gospels in our previous studies, in our online church studies here. But this time we're in the book of Ephesians. And the book of Ephesians goes on from the believing in the Gospel and being saved and given everlasting life by believing in the story of Jesus Christ and that he is the Son of God, the Lord. God himself became a, a man and gave his life for us on the cross so that we could have our sins forgiven. You may know that story in the book of uh, Hasefer Shemot, in the book of Exodus, chapter 12, in the first Passover story, where God said, put the blood of the blemish-free lamb, of the spotless lamb. People had to go out to their herds and they had to look for a spotless, blemish-free lamb. You couldn't just give God your worst stuff because you didn't want it anymore. You had to give him your best things for the sacrifice. And then after a few days, you would kill that lamb, put the blood of that lamb on the doorpost of your house. And then God said, when I see the blood of that blemish-free sacrifice for sins, the blemish-free lamb, I will pass over you in judgment. That was a, a foretelling of what the Messiah would do when he came. God needed a blemish-free sacrifice. That means a sacrifice without sin in our case. Since sin, since sin entered the world through mankind, through Adam and Eve, sin had to be atoned for through man to permanently remove it. But there had to be a blemish-free or a spotless sacrifice. And there was no person in all the world that had no sin. It says three times in the, in the Tanakh, it says, God looked throughout all the world to see if he could find any without sin, any that were righteous or truly sought after God all the time. And sadly, in each of those three verses, two in the book of Psalms, one in the book of Isaiah, he said he found none, no, not one. So God said, well, I will become a man and I will live that life keeping the law at all times, never sinning so that I can be the atoning sacrifice for the sins of mankind because I love them so much. I want them to be with me in the kingdom of heaven and have everlasting life, but they can't be in my kingdom if they have sin in their life because I've already said in the book of Ezekiel that the soul that sins it shall die. So the only way was for him to become a man, live that life that was sinless, a life that no other person had ever lived or could ever live. And then he would allow himself to be killed for our sins and become the atoning sacrifice. That's the love of God. That's how much he loves us. And all who believe 
in him. He said, simply believe in this man that he became, Jesus the Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach. All who believe on him would be saved and given everlasting life and be allowed into the kingdom of heaven because their sins would be atoned for. Sins past, present, and even uh, future shortcomings and sins. That's the love of God, the greatest love story ever told. But now in the book of Ephesians, the apostle Paul is talking to the believers, the new believers there in the uh, city of Ephesus. And there's a combination of Jewish believers, some Gentile believers too. Just like Gentiles could join themselves to the Jewish people as spoken of in the Torah and the Tanakh. In this way, if they believe in the same God, the Jewish God, Elohim, <laughs> and if they believe in the Jewish God, Hashem, then they would join to the Jewish people in the same way if they believe in the Jewish Messiah. They will join with the Jewish people and God will have one body of believers. You say, well, wait a minute. That's just for the Jewish people. Salvation is just for the Jewish people. No, actually, my friend, if you read the Tanakh, your Tanakh, our Tanakh, if you read, if you check, you will find out that God said to the Jewish people, you will be a light to the Gentiles that my salvation will be to the ends of the earth. And to Abraham Avinu, Abraham our father, God said, I will make you a father of many nations. Hmm. Now think about this. If your theology doesn't agree with the word of God, you better check your theology and change your theology. Don't try to change God's word to what you think it should be. You change your theology to what God's word says because in the Tanakh, God says his word will endure forever. That's what you need to do. Let the anchor of your life be the word of God. So Paul is now writing to these believers in Ephesus Jews and Christians, and he's talking to them. He says, he wants to tell them about what their life is about now. He says, okay, you believed. You believed. Thank God you believed, and now you're saved. You have everlasting life, and you will live in the kingdom of heaven forever. But Paul wants you to know there's some other things that are yours, and you don't have to wait for these things. These things start right away as soon as you believe. And Paul is now going to talk about <clears throat> some of these things to these new believers in Ephesus. So today we're going to continue our journey in the book of Ephesians by going through the first 10 verses in chapter 2 of the book of Ephesians. So open your Bibles, have that out in front of you. And my friend, I know you can go to your phone, you can go to your computer, and you can say, oh, find this verse. But you know you need to know where those books in the Bible are. You need to be able to know so that in case you don't have your computer with you one day or in case you lose your phone again, <laughs> we all lose our phones from time to time, then you'll be able to open up a paper Bible and look at it and read it. You remember how that works? I mean, you got these pieces of paper and you turn the pages. You know how that works, right? Remember that way back in ancient history where people used to read things like that? You can do it. Open your Bibles, even if it's on your phone. Have that in front of you as we study. We'll also put those verses up here for you. Anyway, this is what we're going to be talking about in this chapter 2 of the book of Ephesians today. So let's start now at verse 1. It says now in verse 1 of chapter 2 in the book of Ephesians, And you he made alive. Paul is speaking to the Ephesians. Coming on after the end of chapter 1, where <clears throat> he introduced himself and talked to them about how they're going to go on now from salvation and find out what God is doing in their life right now on earth to where they don't have to wait for heaven because God wants to be in their life and with them and doing amazing, miraculous things in their life right here, right now. So Paul says, and you, he, that is God, made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. You who God made alive used to be dead in your trespasses and sins. Verse 2, in which you once walked 
according to the course of this world. This is how everybody in the world walked, just doing whatever you wanted. He says, according to the prince of the power of the air. Who is that? That's Satan. The spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. We'll talk about these verses in just a moment. Verse three then says, among whom also we were once, we once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Paul is saying, he's saying, now remember who you were. You're a believer now, and you've already started seeing changes in your life. You've seen what God is doing. People who knew you, <laughs> who knew you before are now going, wow, what happened to that person? Their life is totally different. They used to walk around <clears throat> just always lusting after other uh, people of the opposite sex and, and lusting after possessions and thinking that money was their God. And they did all these things and they would lie, they would cheat, they would steal. They would do all of these things that were horrible, horrible things. But now, since they say they become a believer in Yeshua, in Jesus, their life is really, really changed. They don't do any of that stuff anymore. Oh, sure, they still have problems, and every once in a while they say the wrong words or <clears throat> maybe have a, have a, have a lapse and they, they think about doing some sin, but at least they think about it and they feel bad about it, and they're really, really changed. They never felt bad about any of their mistakes before, but now they're really, really changed. What happened to them? And Paul is saying, remember, that was you. You once walked around just like everybody else in the world, worshiping money. You were walking around according to the prince of the power of the air. That's Satan. The Bible describes that as Satan. Satan was cast down to the earth out of heaven when he rebelled against God and wanted to be worshiped like God. So he and the, and the third of the angels that followed him became demons and they were cast down to the earth. They were in the kingdom of heaven, where time is everlasting. Now they're cast down to the earth, and the clock is ticking, and Satan knows his time is short. He can't get even with God. He's just a created angel. God is the creator of all things. In a blink of God's eye, God could take Satan and all of his demons and cast their ashes to the edge of the universe. But God is giving people time to believe. And Satan is trying to keep people from believing because since he can't hurt God, God's all powerful, Satan's not. God knows the future, every move that Satan's ever gonna make. He's known, God has known it from the beginning of time. And every move that God makes, it's another checkmate, <laughs> you see, and Satan can't do anything about it. He knows he can't hurt God. He's powerless against God. He doesn't have the wisdom to hurt God. So what does he do? He tries to hurt God's heart by preventing people from having everlasting life. And they were created for everlasting life. That's why the book of Genesis, Hasif HaBereshit Torah, in the book of Genesis, God said he made man in his own image. Well, God is spirit. He's not flesh and body like we have. He's spirit, eternal spirit. You were made in the image of God. You could say you're a hybrid. Yes, you have a fleshly body, and uh, that body sometimes breaks down, and sometimes this breaks down, and we get old, and <clears throat> things happen, and just, you know, just, just like our automobiles, and just like the other things we have, the clothes that we have, eventually they wear out, and they need to be replaced. Uh, one day we're going to get an upgrade if you believe on the Son of God. We're going to be as the angels are in heaven. That's what the Bible says about us who believe. Now, it says that one time we walked around doing all these things wherever our eyes were drawn. Oh, we'd want that. Oh, look at her. We want her. You know, all these things and by nature we were children of sin, children of wrath, just like everybody else. And that's what these verses are talking about, right? Talks about how we always tried to do our own works and do the right thing maybe, but we failed, always failed, over and over and over again. Sometimes we didn't even care that we failed. In fact, we really enjoyed living in sin. 
even though sin was killing us. We are always trying to show that we could be righteous enough without God. We thought we had energy. We thought we had strength. Oh, I could do this. I can handle this. I'll start being good. That's what I'll do. But then you find out that your best intentions didn't work. You couldn't make it happen. But when you think that you can do it without God, that's pride. That's pride. Now, I know we live in a world today that says, oh, this is Pride Day. This is National Pride Month. And they tell people who are uh, having sex with the same sex person, gender person, and totally against nature and against the laws of God. And they tell people, I'm proud of who I am. And so the governments even celebrate, oh, we're proud of them. And they say that because we want their votes. That's why they're proud of them. They may not even agree with them, but they want them to vote for them so that these people and the governments can stay in power. So they make pride days. They make pride month. You're just helping the people. And the people that you're trying to help really need another kind of help. They need to be told about the gospel of Jesus, the Messiah, so that they can have everlasting life and let God be their pride and their hope. In the Tanakh, the book of Proverbs, God says that pride comes before destruction. He says that pride comes before destruction. <clears throat> so if you're proud of your sin, if you're proud, even if you're proud of your theology, whatever it is that makes you proud, your pride is trying to build yourself up. You're real happy with yourself. You're trying to talk about yourself and how good you are to everybody else instead of trying to talk to everybody else about how good God is. You see, God did not create you so that you could live without Him, without His care, without His love, and without His mercy. No, you were created to be God's children, and we were made to depend on Him, to need Him so he could pour out his love on us and provide for us and take care of us. When we try to somehow earn our way into heaven, we're basically treating our walk with God like a, a job. Now, <laughs> you try your works. If, if you're a religious Jew, you know what I'm saying, right? If you're trying by your works, think about it now. Just think about it. You're trying to earn your way into heaven? When you try to earn your way into heaven, well, what do you do when you earn something? That's a job when you earn a paycheck. It's a job, and therefore you're expecting God owes you for what you've done. God doesn't owe you anything, my friend. We all have sin, and according to what he said in the book of Ezekiel, the soul that sins, it shall die. The only thing we are owed is judgment. You may say, well, I try to live most of my life doing good. You know what? You never get to 51%. Even if you think you're approaching 51%, God is not a democracy. His standard is perfect. He's perfect. Humushlam. He is perfect. You're not perfect. Okay? <laughs> no one is perfect. When you expect God to pay you, you haven't earned it, and you never can earn it. God doesn't see just the things that other people see. He sees every thought of your heart. Now think about that. What percentage of the time are you really doing the righteous works of God? Certainly not often. Probably not even 3 or even 5% of your life. You may have some moments that are good, but your sins blot all of those out. And God knows that you need a Savior. You cannot earn your way into heaven. Only God can give you that. In His mercies, in His grace. And when we think like that, we don't really understand that God is perfect and that that's a standard He holds us to. But He's not trying to be mean. In fact, He's trying to show you His love because he wants you to give up on trying to make yourself righteous enough because he knows that that will never get you into his kingdom. 
He knows that that will never get you everlasting life. And so if you just give up, let go and let God have it all, then you will be saved. Believe on his Messiah. Heaven is the place of God's throne. It's the holy place. And sin, as we just said, cannot exist in his presence. His word has already been spoken. The soul that sins, it shall die. He cannot void his word. If sin is in his kingdom, his righteousness would leap out upon it and destroy it. And since that sin resides in us, it would destroy us as well. That's why he gave his son to be the atoning sacrifice to take away our sins when we obey God and believe on his son, the one whom he sent to be the atonement for our sins. That's the story that was revealed to us in Passover. And the only way to heaven is by believing on the Son of God, Yeshua, just like the book of Genesis said, and Abraham believed God and that was counted to him as righteousness. That's in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. I serve a better sheet, the better commissions, the pasuk shesh. It's a sham tif dog. It's there. Check it out. Now we continue on to verse 4. It says, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive with Christ, for by grace you have been saved. Two verses here, verse 4 and 5. I want to talk to you about these two verses just real quickly, but I just want to talk to you first about the first two words in verse 4. But God, you saying, Stephen, that's not even a full sentence. Oh, my friend, it says volumes to us. But God. Let's talk a little while about the importance about those two words. The things that could have happened in your life to destroy you, but somehow changed, it looked like it was going to close in on you and that there was no way out, but God intervened in your life and somehow that problem went away. That illness that almost took you, but God had mercy on you. That job you lost and you didn't know how you were going to make it after then, but God made a way for you anyway. That time when you feared that you would not have a place to live, but God somehow worked it out and you did. Those weren't coincidences, my friend. That was the presence of God. You would have been lost, but God intervened. God wants to care for you like you're his little child. He loves you. That's why he gave his son to be that atonement for our sins so that you could be with him in his kingdom and be safe with him and be provided for and have his love and care forever with everlasting life in the kingdom of heaven. Satan, on the other hand, wants to destroy you. You have these people who say, well, I want to go to hell so I can party with my friends. My, my friend, think about that. Hell is a place of punishment and torture reserved for Satan and his angels and all who would not accept God's salvation and forgiveness in Jesus the Messiah. Satan's not going to let you party. Satan is going to be busy being destroyed along with you, tortured along with you. Satan is not your friend. He's not going to let you party. Satan wants to destroy you to get even with God, to hurt God. But God made a salvation that you could accept by believing on the Son of God and defeat Satan and Satan has no more right to you after that. Even though you've had sins in your life, your sins are now forgiven because of the blood of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. God gave you a way to get away from Satan and have everlasting life in the kingdom of heaven. I love those two words, but God. We were on our way to hell because of the sins we had in our lives and all our sins were destroying our lives, but God. And thank God, thank God that we can be saved from perishing by believing on God's Son, Yeshua. Now we continue on in verse 6. It says, And 
God raised us up together and made us to sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, in Mashiach Yeshua, that is, in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Now talk about that just real quick. That's interesting, isn't it? In verse 6, it says, God raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Who's he talking about there? What do you mean he raised us up together? Remember I said there were Jewish believers in Ephesus and there were also Gentile believers in Yeshua in Ephesus. And before they didn't have anything to do with each other. Jews didn't want to hang out with the Gentiles. Gentiles didn't want to hang out with Jews. And they just set off in their own thing. They weren't together. And, and they said, well, I'm not going to sit with those dirty Gentiles. And the other people say, I'm not going to go over there and sit with those Jewish people. you know. But God forgave our sins on both sides. On both sides. And remember what he said in the Tanakh to the Jewish people. It is not enough that you should be for salvation to the Jewish people alone, to the house of Judah alone, to Israel alone. But he's speaking to the Jewish Messiah now. He said, I will raise you up that you shall be for salvation unto all the nations, unto the end of the earth. That's the word of God in the Jewish Tanakh. Tiftok, Zesham, Malasod, Imazeh, Malasod, and Malasod. There's nothing you can do with that. It's right there. You either believe it or you don't believe it. It's in the Jewish Tanakh. My friends, imatim yodim datim. Atem yodim ma ani omer, nechon? Ze ayemet, ze sham batanach, tif dog. My Jewish friends, my brothers, check it out. It is there. What are you going to do with that? There's nothing you can do with that except to believe that. Hazeh hadavar Elohim. It is the word of God. It is forever. Manetzach. It's forever. You can't ignore it. It's right there. God wants you to be brothers and sisters with the Gentile believers as well. Look, God still has the Jewish people as his chosen people, and they are a special treasure, no doubt. Of course he does. And they have a special role in his kingdom. And God loves them greatly and has a special role for them. But his family is large. And you are going to help the rest of the nations in knowing the Jewish God. That's your future. That's right now. Even right now, there are Jewish men and women who are carrying the story of God's love in Yeshua HaMashiach to the rest of HaYehudim, the Jewish people. Am Israel, Tzrichim. The Jewish people, Israel, needs the forgiveness of God. We all need the forgiveness of God. We all have sin and all would perish except for the mercy and forgiveness of God in His Son, Yeshua HaMashiach. And it says now in verse 7, In the ages to come, God might show His exceeding riches of His grace and His kindness toward us in the Messiah. What is that saying? That even though God is taking care of you today, even though He's guiding you, even though He's directing you, even though He's protecting you, even though He's providing for you, all these things that he's doing today. And yes, even though you're going to have everlasting life in the kingdom of heaven, it says in the angels that come in that everlasting life, he's going to show you the great riches of his grace and kindness. He's going to show you things throughout eternity that are totally going to amaze you. You're going to be in the kingdom of heaven. He's going to show you so many wonderful things and you're going to go, my goodness, I didn't know that even existed. Look at what God has done out there in the universe. Look at what he's doing on earth right now. Look at all the wonderful things he's doing. And yet later, as time goes on in eternity, you're going to see even more things and he's going to continue to bless you and amaze you with wonders. And he's going to dedicate himself to showing you 
the exceeding riches of his grace and goodness because you believed on his son, Jesus Messiah. He loves him so much. He loves you so much. He's going to show you how much he loves you because you loved his son and believed on him. Verse 8 now, as we finish up, verse 8, 9, 10, simply says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that's not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now, we've talked about this grace. We've talked about believing that your sins can be forgiven, not by works that you do, but just because you believe. That way, you don't get the glory. God gets the glory, which is appropriate because you could not and you did not save yourself, but God provided a way for you to be saved by believing on his salvation in Jesus the Messiah. For by grace you've been saved. Verse 8 says, through faith, and that's not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. It's a gift. You didn't make the gift. You didn't wrap the gift. You didn't buy the gift. God did all of the works. It's a gift of God. All you have to do is receive it. But it's not yours until you say, okay, God, I do want this gift. And you believe on the Son of God. It's not of your works because if it were, you'd be boasting. Anyone who is doing works to try to earn their way into the kingdom of heaven is proud of the works that they do. But it's not enough. Just like we said earlier, say, Lama speak. Say, Lama speak. Lama. <laughs> you're not perfect. That's why it's not enough. Because you're not perfect. I'm not perfect. We are not perfect. We need the grace of God. We need the gift of God. We need the mercy of God, the grace of God. We need the gift of God in His Son, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ, as you would say in English. Not of works, because the glory belongs to God. And then our last verse that we said, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. We're his workmanship. He did all the work. We are his project. He's been chiseling away on us. He's been cleaning up the mess. He's been taking out the imperfections. And now he's got things to where he loves it and he can bring it into his kingdom. But it is his workmanship. You, just like you were created, God said, He created man in His image. He created man in His image, and in the same way, He saved you and brought you into His image by His Son. Once you believe on His Son, He sends the Spirit of God into your heart, and now you have that Spirit to where you yourself are crying out, Abba, Father, Abba, Daddy, to God Himself, because you are His child. He wanted you to be His child. That's why He created you in His image. Now this chapter is about the wonderful things that God has done for you and providing a way for you to live forever in heaven with Him now. This chapter is about the wonderful things that God will give you then and the things that he will show you throughout eternity because you believed on his son. And yet the son is also giving you this wonderful life now where God will lead you every day. God will keep you and guide you every day. He will watch over you. He will guide your steps he will order your steps and one day bring you safely into his presence and continue to show you these amazing wonders of his love and care forever and ever and ever. Do you have this hope? Do you have this peace? Do you have this purpose in life? If you don't, 
Why don't you give your life to the Lord today, right now, completely? If you call out to him, he'll hear you. He'll hear that cry and he'll answer you. He'll rescue you from that darkness that you're in and he'll shine his light on your heart and you'll be given a new life, my friend. He'll change you into a totally new person. Throw away all those past failures. You'll just throw them overboard and sail away into your future. You'll be made completely new and given a new start. And he will give you that everlasting life in heaven and that's guaranteed by God himself. Right now, I want to give you an opportunity to believe on Yeshua as the Christ, the Messiah, to believe on Jesus as Messiah and Lord, and to receive God's peace in your own life. You can be saved and given everlasting life in heaven right now, starting immediately by simply believing that God sent his one and only Son into the world to save us from judgment. Just pray something like this. You can repeat it after me if you'd like, but you've got to mean it from your heart. So think about these words as you say them. Just say, God, I do want to know you. I do want to have real peace in life. I really need real peace in life. I believe on your son, Jesus the Messiah, as Lord. Please forgive me all my sins, and I give my life to you, Lord. And I thank you, Lord. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer, the good news is, is God heard you. Even if you said it in your heart, he heard you. In fact, he's already started working in your life. A little seed's been planted deep down in your heart. And over time, you're going to be begin to see the wonderful changes that God is making in your heart as that little seed starts to grow, throws out roots to gather the minerals and the food from the ground and the the throws out and grows toward the sunshine where it gets the light to grow. You get in a good Bible-based church. You learn about him every day in his word. Don't go somewhere where they're just talking about politics or they're telling you what, whatever the pastor thinks. You go somewhere that teaches the word of God. The word of God is eternal. He said in the Tanakh, the Jewish Tanakh, Lord, your word endures forever. Study his word like a student. Tamudim, Tzrichim Lilmod, Et Hadavar Elohim. Students need to study the Word of God, right? Talk to God every day in prayer. He's going to do beautiful and amazing things in your life. No. 